Now, um, two, two, the, the two figures then, who we have to, uh, in, in closing here, I'll mention, two figures whom uh, sort of bring us to the modern day. And I think start sketching out a picture of this that will seem more, um, uh, more familiar to us. The first, of course, is, uh, is Thomas Hobbes. We can never have these discussions without Thomas Hobbes. Uh, Hobbes largely shared, uh, well, I mean, he, he pretty much entirely shared Bowdoin's definition of sovereignty, and he also um, agreed with Bowdoin that the sovereign should be a, a single natural body, should be a king, right? However, he granted the possibility that it didn't necessarily have to be. And in Leviathan, this famous book where he uh, pounds all this, Frequently, when he refers to the sovereign, he defines it as a man or an assembly of men. And to my knowledge, it's the first time anyone talks about sovereignty as being divisible. That it doesn't have to be one natural body person, a king. That sovereignty can, in fact, be spread widely among many people, a group of people, an assembly. What does an assembly actually mean? Does it mean, you know, a group of people who assemble, or it means the, you know, the assemblage of all people? So people started thinking, started uh, interpreting uh, Hobbes' suggestion, is that, well, Hobbes would prefer the sovereign to be a king. Maybe an aristocracy can be sovereign. Maybe a democracy can be sovereign. Right? So this is, these are thoughts that had not been raised before, prospects that had not been considered before. The other important thing, of course, that Hobbes contributes is that for him, this is a covenant, is his word. It's a covenant. So all these prior sovereignty theorists, Machiavelli and Bodin and Botero and Farmer, all these guys, had all treated sovereignty as a natural fact. It grew out of the nature of the king as a, you know, a, a representative of God. Um, but Hobbes says that in fact, and he's very explicit about this, that sovereignty comes from the people giving voice to their own willful act of suspending their own power, giving it to the sovereign. And this is where the idea of the social contract comes from. So the idea is that the sovereign is created, has all the powers of the sovereign, above a party separate, above the law, above the people, but it's created by the people. Does it mean sound familiar? Okay. So this is, I think it's, I think you make a legitimate case that the modern world is actually born in the pages of Leviathan. And he really you know, lays down the, the framework for what becomes uh, the, the modern state, uh, modern government. Um, the second person we have to look at, well, as a consequence of, well, maybe, no, I don't want to say it, in tandem with, um, Hobbes opening up of the prospect that sovereignty can be possessed in an aristocracy or in a democracy, in the visible in some way. We have the development that begins really, uh, I guess, in the 17th century, but becomes huge in the 18th century, is this growing idea that, well, if sovereignty can be divisible, then why not divisible among everybody, right? So the idea of the people as sovereign, popular sovereignty, the late in the late 18th century, of course, this intellectual life in Europe is full of this kind of talk. The American and French revolutions are full of this kind of talk. We the people, right? You know? All this kind of thing. But I put it to you, if it was a little odd that the king, who's supposed to his mystical body, ties the whole kingdom together, it's a little odd how he was also simultaneously going to be you know, above, apart, and separate from his own mystical body. That's a little weird, you know, but they, you know, they, they, they tried to work around that. But if that's a little weird, how is it at all possible that the people, all the people, can be collectively above, apart, and separate from themselves? I mean, what, what can that possibly mean? This seems, on the face of it, to be an absurdity. Sadly. Um, this very case was all too convincingly, and I think rather tragically, uh, made by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. 
um, and he largely is responsible for the popularity of this idea, because this is exactly what he argues in the social contract, his famous book on this, is that the, 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 the people all together embody a collective sovereignty that is indeed above them. And no individual, no group of individuals are justified in speaking against this, this mystical body. He doesn't use the term the mystical body, but that's what he's talking about, the mystical body of the people, because it transcends any individual. It transcends any group of individuals. Maybe you remember your, your, uh, your, your Rousseau from uh, you know, college or anything, you know what I'm talking about is what Rousseau calls the general will. The general will is basically um, uh, Rousseau's word for the sovereignty of the mystical body. But of course, that creates a problem, right? If no individual and no group of individuals can actually speak for the general will, Right? Because the people say, no, 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 I say it says this, well, I say it says this, I say, you know. Well, you know, it transcends all these differing opinions, right? You know, that's the whole point. So how can this sovereignty act in the world? How can it have any effectiveness in the world? No individual can represent it. I mean, you know, a king, we know who to go to, right? We know who says what's what, right? Who says what's what if all the people are collectively sovereign? state. The state which is not a person. The state is not a person. No one is the state. Lots of people work for the state. Nobody is the state. It is the state as this abstract institution that somehow represents the general will, that represents the sovereignty of the mystical body of the people. And now this should be sounding very familiar. In fact, I think, I, mean, I, I sort of threw this in the paper, I don't know if I'm really, I don't really well, I think there's an interesting case that the, 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 the child of Rousseau might be a Franz Kafka. You're familiar with that, or the writing of Franz Kafka. He's very often, not always, but often writes these stories about these, these poor little persecuted guys, you know, they're just getting the run around by the state, they don't know what's going on. The, the, the trial is the famous one, where this guy's just constantly being processed all the time, and there's always some new sort of faceless, nameless bureaucrat who's processing him, and he can't find out, you know, you know, what he's charged with, or if he's been charged with anything, or, you know, what he can do to end this process, you know, kind of like that. It's, it's kind of, that's you know, kind of like, you know, Rousseau's picture of, you know, the same. Because, I mean, in the old, you know, with Hobbes and Bodin, we know, we can go to the king, right? You know, I mean, you want mercy, you want justice, you can go to the king. He may say no, but, I mean, at least you know who to talk to, right? I mean, in, the, you know, in, in Rousseau's world, there is no one, really, right? I mean, no one ultimately has the authority. Everyone kind of works for someone else in some sense, right? So, uh, that's kind of the, the world of the state that, that I think Rousseau takes us. So, I'm, I'm hoping that from this, this brief survey of massive swaths of history, uh, you can see what I'm getting at is that it, uh, it seems to me that when people are talking about this idea of the implicit social contract, this idea that we're all you know, in it together, and, and you know what I'm talking about. Right, you know that you know certain sacrifices have to be made for the social good. You know, certain actions have to be taken for social interests. Or the we statements, y'all, the we statements, right? You know, right? You know, that we've decided that everyone needs universal health care. You know, or you know, we we stole the land from the Indians, or you know, public debt doesn't matter because we owe it to ourselves. You know, and all this kind of, as though you know we're all part, you know, we're all in this together, and you don't have a choice to not be part of it. And the reason you don't have a choice. It's because it's a single body, it's a single entity, it's a super organism, it's a mystical body. That's what I think lies behind all this. Now, to close, I suppose, is, you know, one might say, well, what, what, where does this lead us? Um, certainly the challenge seems to be um, uh, uh, important. I mean, you know, if what I'm saying is true, um, uh, a couple things we can say. I mean, you, you, you can see, I hope, that 
the, the mystical body gives rise to the possibility of sovereignty. You can't be above a part of separate something unless the something is already there, right? You know? At the same time, the sovereignty is necessary to keep together the mystical body so it doesn't break up into competing interests, right? You know, and then when we get to Rousseau, the state becomes the expression of this in the real world. These things are all tied together, they're not separate things. This is something that I didn't really understand before I started doing this research. Right? This is all part of the same thing. Right? I mean, you kind of have to confront the mystical body question the implicit social contract question, if you're going to confront the state. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're, they're, they're not like cousins, they're like Siamese twins, you know, historically. But of course, that raises the question of you know, rhetorical strategy. How do you deal with this, right? Because if what I'm saying is true, and I don't know if it is or not, but if it's true, then I think it's, it's, it's not unrealistic to propose that that this idea, implicit social contract idea is not, a, is not a metaphor for theology or a simile. It actually is theology. It actually is religion. And you know, and people, oh, we live in a rational time, it's all about science and reason, you know? I, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe in fact, you know, our politics are in fact still deeply religious. And you know, and uh, you know, I can understand why that would be. But of course, it, you know, back to the question of rhetorical strategy. I mean, how do you how do you deal with that? I mean, have you ever tried to talk to anyone out of believing in God? I mean, you know, it doesn't usually work, right? <laughs> you know. So I mean, I don't think that I, I, I don't think, I'm not convinced that that's the right approach. And that used to be my approach of trying to convince people, oh, this thing doesn't exist if you're talking about it. Maybe that's not the right approach. You know, that's uh, I don't know if that that works. Anyways, these are my thoughts and. Uh, I was uh, happy that you were here to listen to them and share them. Thank you. Yeah.